never knew how to tell you. I would tell be able what? to talk about my Can life. You what? I, I ever loved a lot. I have a two yeah, moms. You want me to say it out loud? This place is a place for the past uh, 15 years where an informal collect collective of trans people has lived, but it's not just trans people, it's actually a queer community, and um, even some non-queer people have lived here, but after they leave here, they're queer. Uh, <laughs> People just came and informally we began to be, we just referred to ourselves actually as transy house, you know, sort of self-mocking in a way, like calling yourself queer or something like that. And then so many people, like mostly trans people, were asking us if they could live there. And it became evident that there was a housing problem. You have people whose parents kick them out of this, kick them out in the street because they're trans. And they, feel harassed out of the school system so they don't have they don't get to you know they most of them don't finish high school they're lucky if they get a GED or whatever I think the world is so uncertain out there <laughs> you know like when people look at what's happening and what they face it is it's not you don't have to be like gender variant to think you know what's going on you know well, how am I going to make it in the world and that's even worse for anybody that's queer, because that gives you an excuse to get put to the side. Entering the tranny den. <laughs> Please excuse the little man sleeping there. Um, this used to be the dining room. The dining room was here. There was a big table here. There was always little windows here. You know what I'm saying? There was a couple little shelves here, but now, you know, this is like a little altar that I have here, a spiritual altar, you know? I went to live, I had my own little place where I was living at, and then I was renting a room. And there was this lady that I was living with, you know. She kind of had like um, the serious boyfriend problem. Her boyfriend kept breaking the door down, trying to kill her. Now one day I was at work and he went looking through my stuff. He found mail and everything and papers and one of my IDs. He told her that, you know, that he didn't want men living in the house. Guy coming in with a gun and a knife all the time, chasing them after her. So I said, either I stay there or, or, that, or I get killed. So I kind of went to my mother's house. I came out to my grandmother, finally. She accepted it for maybe like um, a month. And then she went plum loca. She went crazy. She came out to her grandmother, explained to her about transgender things, etc. And her grandmother said, you're possessed of the devil and you're evil, get out, you must get out, and just threw her out. She made me change my hair color, I had blonde hair and everything. She, I had to dye it black, and it still didn't work out, and then I had to leave. So Celia was like thrown out in the street. So she went to the women's shelter. Can't come in here because you're, you know, such, you're still a man on your ID. 
And so she went to the men's shelter and they said, you can't come in here because even though you're men on your ID, it would be totally disruptive for you to come in here. You look too much like a woman. Unless something has changed very recently, they put the trans women in with the men where they'd get beaten, robbed, raped, and generally abused. And they end up working the street until they contract something fatal and die of it. That's what I that's what we've witnessed. That's what's it's that raw, that tragic and that real. This is us. This is us being at home. Well, we were trying to build a home. It didn't work out, unfortunately, but I don't know. We just want to be ourselves. The woman we are inside out. Right? Am I wrong? She's right. <laughs> She's so right. <laughs> A lot of people would come in and say, you know, this is so cool. I've never been in a place where all the people are trans. You know, there's everybody is accepting of trans people. It was like the dominant thing rather than having one trans person with a lot of, you know, non-trans people. If you live there, you're sharing certain responsibilities and having group meetings and stuff like that. Anybody could come in and be accepted, and I think um, there's people for for shelter, you know, and there's also just friends like me, you know, who, who just stop by. I have so many friends who are like, I need to come over to your house and like talk to your parents and to hang out and sort of like give me lessons on, you know, queer history. A lot of people, a lot of my friends, when they first meet me, they're like, oh my god, I know where you live. Like, I've heard of that place, you know, like, those are your parents. <laughs> We always represented sort of a more radical uh, activist approach in a way, or, or political approach. We've always been, you know, the, the bargaining chip, you know, on any legislation. Okay, we'll give you the trans people, we'll get those really weird people out, and then the straight gays and lesbians can, you know, just be like everybody else in middle America and get the protection. We tried to, you know, advocate for trans inclusion and everything, and uh, I think the deal actually was in, in a way to, uh, for some of the so-called trans leaders to say, okay, we'll, you know, we'll accept just getting a, a trans protection or in New York City, and then we won't try to be in the state bill, whereas we took the position that, yeah, we should be protected in the city, and we should be protected in the state, and uh, if the state doesn't you know, if we're not included in the state, then we should vote it all down. You know, it's, it's not right to have the gay and lesbian people get up and not the trans people. Chelsea had ta told us about Sylvia Rivera and how she had this housing for trans street people or just queer street people in the early 70s. We sort of began to see ourselves a little bit in that model. 
And then lo and behold, Sylvia Rivera showed up and, hmm. you know, started to come over to visit us. And she was like, oh, wow, you people are doing what I always dreamed of doing. So Sylvia was there. And then Sylvia started to get back into politics because we, in effect, provided sort of a support for Sylvia that she really had never had. She really started to roll then as a political leader, resurrected. You mean this is, you're addressing the whole Pride Parade? Yes. That was a lot How many people were in front of you? I... 500,000. Yeah, yeah, we could say that because it was, you could hear me everywhere. I told them very nicely to remember that they wouldn't be having gay world pride in Italy if it wasn't for the transgender that fought in 1969 at the Stonewall. And they went crazy. At one point in between my speech, they started calling me a living myth in Italian mystic or mystical or something, mm -hmm. and the crowds just kept on hollering that. And it was like, really, uh, I'll never get that respect here. after I got back, she couldn't wait. Yeah. And then after all, all that was said and done, I was like, well, did you get it off your chest? We didn't have it during Gay Pride Week. Yeah. So now we had it when I came back from it. Yeah. I said, are we happy? Yeah. Oh, my God. She ended up with everybody in the house. Oh, yeah. Except, well, a little bit with Boris Elliott. Wait, this one is a ham. <laughs> I turned the ha camera on her, she's like, into me. it. <laughs> Communal living is difficult. There's a lot of emotional conflicts that happen. It's like being in a family. It's just sometimes, you know, there were some girls, I didn't say all, but there were some girls that came and wanted to, like, take over the home that we loved, that the home that we called home, you know? because they realized, they felt that, no, they got a little too comfortable. What I had in mind was handpicking friends to live with us in a communal living experiment, an intentional group of people who already knew and liked each other. What happened instead was that, I'm not sure exactly how it all happened, but basically the word got out to the various social workers in the trans community that Transy House was this, like, homeless shelter where every time they had somebody, they a transgendered person that was difficult to place, they tried to dump them on us. This is a temporarily stay. To make no, to bring them up, and to so they can get back on their feet and get on with their lives, you know. Right. Some people already have places actually they want to know where they can go, but they end up staying here because they were convenienced by the no that Rusty didn't charge them any rent, you know. What I'm saying they they no they cooked here all they want, they ate all they want, they slept when they wanted to. Having a nice middle-class mm -hmm. college professor and her hippie girlfriend trying to deal with these tremendous social problems in one little brownstone it's you might as well try to sweep the tide back with a broom
you know, like it was harder without Sylvia, but also just um, I was nearing retirement age and it was hard to keep things together. Chelsea was tired of being a 24-7 social worker. So, and also the physical house was getting totally run down. And the girls that were staying there had no respect for me whatsoever. They laugh at anything I said to try to keep any kind of order or put any kind of rules on them whatsoever. We were convinced that this model of having a residential place for young trans women was the best model you know, in terms of what was good to help people find themselves, so to speak. It reached to a point where, you know, that Rusty has actually served her time doing what she has done for us, you know what I'm saying? And for many girls that have passed, come and gone, you know what I'm saying? You know, like, I, I'm disappointed sometimes. I think, like, all the effort and everything and the money and et cetera, that, you know, what did we accomplish? We just, like, stockpiled people for a while and then they were back doing something else, you know? Like, you just try to help somebody and in a way, it's sort of like a, the parent bird, you know, like you push the nestling out of the nest eventually because they've got to go out and fly out of the nest, so to speak, and it's, it's a hard thing to do. This has been an a experience. Maybe one of these days I will open a house which will help trans women. Until then, who knows?